خیابانگانی دیگر با شما هستم پیش از هر چیز از دست رفتن جان تعدادی از هموطنان آتش نشان رو به خانواده و عزیزانشون تسلیت میگیم. باعث ناراحتی همه ایرانیان خارج از کشور و داخل کشور هست که گروهی که جان خودشون رو برای نجات جان دیگران هدیه میکنند دولت و ساختار حاکم کمترین امکاناتی رو در اختیارشون قرار نمیده. باعث تأصفه که بر اساس گزارشی در شهر تهران تنها 120 ساختمان استاندارد داریم که در مقابل حوادث طبیعی و غیر طبیعی مقاوم تر باشند. اگر اتفاق ناگواری در تهران بیاد که سالهاست جوفزیکدانان منتظرش هستند یعنی زمین لرزه بزرگ ما با واقعی روبرو هستیم که به هیچ عنوان آتش نشانان امکان نجات بسیاری از شهروندان رو نخواهند داشت. و جان بسیاری از آنها متاسفانه از دست خواهد رفت. وقتی کشورهایی که حکومتهای غیر پاسخگو دارند و جای خودشون رو صرف تقویت زیر ساختان نمی کنند و به ظاهر سازی می پردازن. مثل اون چیزی که در تهران دیدیم به ویژه از دوران سازندگی تا کنون با شهر بزرگی روبرو هستیم که وقتی ساختمان 17 طبقه آتش می گیره نردبان آتش نشانی به طبقه های بالای اون نمی رسه. متاسف باید باشیم که بایستی یک اتفاق ناگوار بیفته تا جمهوری اسلامی متوجه باشه که چقدر زیر ساختهای ضعیفی داره. آتش گرفتن ساختمان پلاسکو یک نشان است. خدا به داد هموطنان ما برسه. در برنامه های مختلف آبانگان گزارش های سگانه تاماس فریدمن از منطقه خاورمیانه در باره خشکسالی و بحران آب رو با هم دیدید. امروز هر سه برنامه رو مجددن کنار هم میبینیم. I've spent decades reporting on the Middle East, but I have to say The events in Syria these days are some of the most heartbreaking I have ever seen. I thought I knew how it all started with protests over government repression and widespread poverty in early 2011. Hi. Tom Friedman. Thanks Hi. for coming. Thank you. But then I met Farhan Asif, a young Syrian refugee living here in Washington, D.C. And she made me wonder if there might be a lot more to this story. They are talking about Trump when I was young. I was uh, 11 or something like this. She told me that before the Civil War, she had lived through another disaster. So is this year after year, less year rain? Year after year, oh, government yeah. doesn't try to help in any kind of way. And that the government's response made they people so angry, they were eager to take to the streets. She said, I couldn't understand the Civil War if I didn't understand what happened in the drought. Most of uh, farmers, they leave to Damascus, to homes, So they move from the countryside uh, yeah, yes. to the city? To the city. They live in very poor area on Damascus. Like you can find 10 person in one room. Wow. If you, if you notice that most of the uh, people in revolution, they are from countryside, countryside really? of Syria. Later I learned that this drought was the worst in Syria's modern history. And that it happened in the four years just before the revolution. Over a million people were displaced. And according to the United Nations, more than two million were forced into extreme poverty. It's really scary. That was scary. And this drought was part of a trend. According to a study by the U.S. government's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, over the last 40 years, climate change has caused the Mediterranean region to dry out, resulting in longer, more severe droughts. The places in red are getting the worst of it, and Syria is right at the epicenter. I also come across a confidential U.S. diplomatic cable written two years before the revolution. 
it contains some dire predictions. A UN official stationed in Syria feared the drought would throw the entire country into chaos. But can there really be a connection between a drought and a civil war? Hey, it's Thomas Friedman from the New York Times. Climate change is now well understood to be a major national security issue and a source of a stress on a number of the underlying causes of conflict. Drought, floods, food shortages, water scarcity. All of these drive increased uh, human insecurity, poverty, uh, and can contribute to conflict. How much do you feel that stress in northern Syria where you had this region afflicted by drought from 2006 to 2010, right on the eve of the revolution there, um, contributed to it. It's very hard to, to quantify. However, we all know that you know, where there is drought, where there is insecurity, when there is poverty, hunger, poor governance, repressive policies, it may make the tinder in the box uh, more uh, readily uh, ignitable. In other words, if a drought is bad enough, it can help push an already stressed society to the breaking point. Is that what happened in Syria? I first visited the Middle East as a teenager and fell in love with it. Eventually, I studied Arabic and made this part of the world a focus of my work as a reporter at the New York Times. In a region with no shortage of troubled countries, Yemen stands out as one of the most unstable. When I arrive, Yemen's president invites me to meet with him. He wants to talk about something that threatens to destabilize his country even more, water. How is the climate changing in, in Yemen? Is it drier? Does it rain as much? Does it rain harder? Uh, rains uh, are, are rare. What it's becoming less. And uh, if there is rain, it is, is very strong and it is uh, devastating, destructive. We are not used to such a climate. Uh, in the past, rain would be, would be uh, fair and it would continue for a week or a month, but it is fair rain. And he's seen this change in his life growing up here. It's the first time I see this. In my whole life, I did not witness such a thing. Interesting. The president says that in some places, the water situation is so dire, it's leading to violence. In terms of water issues, what is the biggest water challenge Yemen faces today? Could Yemen run out of water? Yes, possible. Could. Well. This is all Hasaka province. I'm from Hasaka city. I'm less okay. than an hour's drive from the Syrian border. 
On the other side, a civil war is raging, the world's deadliest conflict. I'll introduce myself. I, I work as a, as a medic and safety consultant. I served in the Balkans, in Sarajevo, Afghanistan. This will be my 10th trip into Syria. But I'm not here to write about the latest battle. There's a different disaster I'm interested in. One I hope will tell me something about the real roots of this conflict. Khabur River starts from Syrian city of Ras al -Ain, and it ends with Euphrates River. Gotcha. It feeds into the Euphrates. Yeah, obviously. that area people, they really suffered from uh, the drought. The rain average started to reduce, uh, re reduce heavily and it stopped totally. The it actually stopped? Yeah, wow. but uh, I remember how it was because we used to go to swim there. Huh. Yeah, and then not anymore. Four years before the Civil War started, Syria was hit by a drought that lasted until just before the revolution. A drought so devastating that it altered the lives of millions of Syrians. Soon after I arrive in Yemen, I'm reminded of how unstable this country is. These people are mourning a young political leader who was recently gunned down. Political violence is all too common here. And there's a big reason for Americans like me to care about what happens in Yemen, because this country is also home to the most active chapter of Al Qaeda, which is why Yemen's water crisis is so frightening. Even in Yemen's capital, getting water isn't always as simple as turning on the faucet. Those who can afford it have water trucked to their homes. Others have to depend on public fountains or the charity of their local mosque. And the problem isn't just temporary. What the president told me seems to be true. According to experts, this could be the first country in the world to actually run out of water completely. Just across this square, I'm meeting with one of those experts, Kyle Foster, a development consultant who first came to Yemen 25 years ago as a Peace Corps volunteer and decided to stay. The water that's used for drinking and for agricultural purposes is uh, the reservoir groundwater, fossil water that has been trapped underground for eons. I'm not willing to say it's gonna run out tomorrow, but we're on a wing and a prayer. So why is this well important? It was, you know, once a usable well. So when they dug this well, how, how far would they have had to dig uh, in order to get water? Yeah, these wells um, are about 50 to 60 meters, which was typical until um, maybe 30 years ago. If they were digging it today, how far down would they have to go? 800 meters. 800 meters? Even 1,000. Water from an underground reservoir is finite. There's an end to it somewhere. We don't know exactly where that end's going to be. Right now, climate change probably isn't playing a big role. But scientists do know that climate change will increase water scarcity in dozens of countries around the world, especially in large parts of Africa, Asia and the Middle East, as well as the southwestern United States. So what's happening in Yemen now could be a glimpse into our future. And that future is frightening. I'm joined by Abdul Rahman al iryani the president's advisor on climate change. He's taking me to a place where the struggle for water has turned deadly. Exactly, are we heading now? We are, we are going straight south from Sana'a, about uh, 200 kilometers distance, to Ta'al City, which is the second biggest city in Yemen. Huh? This city was the first city really to run out of water. 
They are getting the water now every step between 30 and 40 days. They get it for one, one day or two days. And then I have to wait 30 or 40 more days for to water get, to come to up. Get it again, yes. And what do I do in between? The rest of the time they have to buy from, from tankers at a very uh, high cost. We are going to Mount Saber, which is above the city of Taz. And there, there is an ancient spring. And there, there is a, a conflict between two villages about the spring. Just yesterday, there were some killings also. So they actually got in a gunfight over who controls the spring? Yeah, fighting. Uh, last time they used even bazookas and uh, heavy machine guns. This is very common, actually. Close to 60% of all rural conflicts, the main cause is water. Wow. As we touch down, I'm shocked that a city this big could really be running out of water. What part of the country would you describe this as? Are we north? Are we? You know? It's south of the north. So central Yemen? Are we? Central Yemen. Yeah. Uh, central Yemen. And the village that where the fighting was. It, it, two villages, one is called Kuraba, Q-R-A-D-H. And the other was? Al Marzuh. This is uh, the no man's land between Kuraba and Al Marzuh. And from here, I can throw a stone to Marzuh and another stone to Kuraba. It's only, what, 400 meters apart or less 300 meters, huh? I think that uh, water scarcity make people crazy. First, I meet with the leaders of Al Marzu to understand how the conflict became so violent. Can I see your dagger? That's, That's really cool. <laughs> Whoa, that is real. That's a piece of work. I hope it's only used to cut fruit. <laughs> it's only decoration. Gotcha. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. Is, is Ahmed actually one of the official leaders of, of Mar, uh, from Marzu, or is he just he is, a, a spokesman? Yeah, he is the sheikh, and gotcha. he is the spokesman. Gotcha. من ذو ثلاثة عشر عام كان نشب الحرب أو المشكلة فيما بيننا وبين الإخوة في قرابة. Thirteen years ago, this conflict started. الإخوة في قرابة. إخواننا باختصار شديد بغوا علينا فقاموا بتفجير الخزانات التي عملتها الدولة بما يقارب ب 20 مليون ريال وفصلوا الخز... القصبة التي هي التابعة للمرزح وضموا الماء كامل إلى إلى قرابة Next, I meet the leaders of Karada كبير يعني ما كان فيش مشكلة في قبل عشرات السنين What he's saying is that uh, the people were living for hundreds of years without any conflict it's only recently because too many people and too little amount of water. He's saying that one third of the spring is still on. Two thirds is gone. The was in the Uros, about 9 how old was he? كم عمره؟ years. So he was a casualty of this water conflict. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so, so sorry. أولا أحس بألم ما قد وصفوا الناس ولا كتبوا الكتب ولا أشتي أحد يصاب بهذا المصاب. This is my last stop before I leave Yemen, the hospital where the latest victim of the water conflict is recovering. Well, this is uh, uh, Mohammed Kaid, who is from Karaba. He was hit with three bullets, uh, maybe three, four days ago, and uh, he survived. 
قدر بولي الغداء غدي أزود على طلقة نار من الطاقة لشق سن وما أصطم مكان There is no politics on for anything. Just all, all just for the water. That's what he's saying. We need to leave him rest. Thank you very much. Feel better. As we depart, I'm still finding it hard to believe what's happening here, even though I've seen it with my own eyes. In America, when we think about the roots of violence, we think about struggles for money and power, or clashes over religion and ideology. But to me, there is something uniquely terrifying about people killing each other over something as fundamental as water, because that is a fight for survival. And if Yemen is a preview of what climate change has in store for other parts of the world, it could become a fight for survival on a terrifying scale. On my way to Syria, I learned about a family that recently fled the war and is now taking refuge here. كان عندنا اراضي زراعيه كانت في يعني الامطار كانت حيل زينه يعني كانت امطار سنويه حيل زينه تمطر علينا بمطر بهاي وكانت الاراضي حيل مرويه بعدين فجاه صار فيها الجفاف هذا ارض قحله صارت ملحه يعني شوفي يعني ايش قد ما اوصف لك ما راح نوصف على هالشيء هذا اللي شفناه 17 سنه تقريبا يعني انه فقدنا الارض حولنا من اي شيء لاي شيء Had you ever seen anything like that before? لا يعني ما يعني انا الي سنين يعني نزرع وهي بحياته ما مر علينا هالجفاف هاي اول مره يصير عندنا هالجفاف هذا اول مره احنا كنا قاعدين بالدوام وعم نحكي انه في قحل وفي جفاف لازم العالم لازم الحكومه تساعد بس ما حدا عم يستجيب بالعكس اجوا اخذونا على التحقيق وعلى الاساس يوم والثاني وفي الاخير اعتقلونا لمده شهرين اعتقلونا لمده شهرين اخذوهم ما اعتقلوها وحطوها بالسجن يعني شيء صعب وبعدين طلعنا على الاساس انه ما حد يحكي نهائيا مع اول صيحه الله اكبر احنا كلياتنا قمنا للثوره مباشرة بعدين أنا كنت مرابطة يعني من المرابطين بالثورة بس من نصاب ابني محمد أخذته وطلعت فيه على لهون على تركيا And what are your plans now? You want to go back and rejoin your your comrades and, and continue the revolution? أكيد أرجع 
وكملنا الشيء اللي مشينا عليه بالاول الشيء اللي حلفنا عليه من الاول How many other Syrians, I wonder, have a similar story to tell? The answer is on the other side of that border. I'm told there's a rebel commander leading a group of failed farmers turned fighters. That's where I'm heading. Once we cross the border, the signs of war are everywhere. Tom, nice to meet you. Thank you very much. وبي منهم مسلحين ناس كثير يعني انضمت للثوار من اصدقائنا ومن قرايبنا ومن اخواننا هذا ابن اخوي وهذا ابن ابن عمي يعني ابن اخوي وهذا اخوي وهذا ابن اخوي وهذا ابن اخوي وهذا ابني وهذا ابن اخوي وهذا ابن خالي The commander tells me he used to be a cotton farmer but when the drought hit he had to turn to smuggling to feed his family فيقضبني النظام يسجني أطلع أخرى أشتغل بالتهريب لأنه ولادي جوعاني الجوع يخلى الواحد يساوي كل شيء يعني say starving makes you do anything طبعا كل حياتنا هي كذا all our life like that طبعا إحنا يعني أنا أفكر مرات إنه مثلا الزراعة أخي مزارع فاشل الثاني فاشل الثالث فاشل لا when they write the history of the this revolution how important will the drought be? Bani Adam, مثل الحرب يتأقلم مع كل الأجواء. أنت لمن الأرض قاحلة حكم الله ما تقدر ت. بس لمن تشوف إنه أنت محكوم من الرب هالحكم والأب منطيق ظهره. بدك تصيح تقول جوعان. فلمن تسمع إنه ما حد استجاب. بدك تزعل. فاحنا صار معانا الأمور هاي كليتها. فقمنا على الثورة وثورة حرية ثورة جياع After sharing a meal with the commander, it's time to turn back. It's dangerous to linger around here, even this close to the border. Later, I'll find out that this town was taken over by Al Qaeda and that a hundred people were executed. As we leave, the words of the Syrian commander ring in my head. He called it a revolution of freedom and a revolution of the hungry. Droughts are nothing new. Neither are brutal dictators, religious conflicts, or people's desire for freedom. But for the Syrians who lived through it, the drought will be forever seared into their memories and forever shape their feelings toward the regime they now seek to overthrow. And the rest of us should take notice. This volatile part of the world is only getting hotter and drier. More droughts may mean more people displaced, more lives uprooted, perhaps more war. And we'd be very foolish to think it won't affect us. به خاطر عدم پاسخگویی و عدم درایت دولت سوریه در حل بحران آب بین سالهای 2006 تا 2010 بیش از یک میلیون کشاورز و دامدار مهاجرت کردند به حاشیه شهرهای بزرگ این کشور و همین حاشیه نشینها بسیارشون به جنگ داخلی سوریه پیوستند خیلی هاشون کشته شدند و خیلی هاشون مهاجرت کردند به اروپا و به هر شکل بدون سر و سامان شدند همین اتفاقی که میتونه برای کشاورزان ایرانی بیفته که زمینهایشون آب دیگه نداره و مهاجرت میکنن به حاشیه شهرها 
و بعد از چند سال وقتی امکانات کافی براشون وجود نخواهد داشت با کوچکترین جرقه ای ممکنه به شورش های خشونت آمیز بپیوندند. پی